dismissed. Amen. Listen, I'm really excited this morning. Uh, my brother Matt Darden is here, and I just want to just real quick uh, give Matt an introduction. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time, give him time to preach, like I said. But um, so Matt and I used to go to church together at uh, Crossing Place in Franklin. I was on the elder board there for a while whenever Pastor Brad was there. And uh, I really didn't know a Matt. I mean, it was kind of a big church. I mean, I mean, at one point in time, we had like 750 people over there. So you, you two services, actually a Saturday night service, two services on Sunday. So we'd run into each other, you know, and I would think to myself, not that, you know, I was saying, man, that's a nice looking guy. You know, he looks like he probably played football. Never really got a chance to talk to him. But then I ended up uh, writing a book and I was talking to Pastor Brad about the book. And one day he was like, hey, man, you want to talk about your book tonight? So I preached a message and uh, it had to do with the, the war of Babylon, which is interesting because we're about to get into a series about end time stuff. And it's all up in there. But anyway. It was, it was about, uh, the, mess, the, the message was about the war of Babylon, and really at the end, Matt came up to me and he said, dude, he's like, man, can I get one of them books? So he was, I wanted to make one of the first people to buy one of my books, and uh, I think he might have bought one for his grandmother too, I'm not real sure how that went, but anyway, then Pastor Brad let me do this little teaching thing on the occult, and because the name of the book was Occult Exposure, and Matt came to every class, and he was encouraging, and you know, whatnot. But one of the things that Matt would tell you that, you know, I'm not trying to tell his testimony, I'm not saying he will, I think he just got a word for us this morning, amen? But um, he was he was kind of shy, I mean, it, it, wasn't really, it wasn't a real talkative kind of guy from, from what I remember. And I'm going to be honest with you, Matt and I did not really become that close even then, I mean, I was appreciative that he approached me and whatever. Well, then one day after um, I had kind of left, and I, I think I had started the church. Yeah, I had started the church because I didn't leave Crossing Place till we started the church. I get a text from him, and he's like, hey, man, give me a call, you know, or, or an email maybe. I don't remember. Anyway, I called him up, and this was the story. He said, he said, dude, I've been listening to some of these YouTube videos, man. And he said, I've been really, he said, I've been listening to a lot of them. And I've been like really just like soaking this stuff up. And I'm like, well, praise God, dude. He said, this is the deal. I got an opportunity to preach in youth ministry coming up Wednesday night. I wanted to, if it's okay with you, if you have time, I just want to shoot my notes over to you and just let me know if you think that I'm on the right. Hey, dude, I opened up this email and I started reading these notes. And I'm like, oh my goodness, man. I'm, what I'm talking about is the content, the content of the word, amen, and, and and then just the writing, how succinct it was, and I was just like, dude, because that's just how I talk, I just say dude a lot, I'm like, dude, this stuff is on fire, you hear me, and this is the word of the living God, and I said, now look, Matt, I don't know, he, he said, man, I'm a little bit nervous, I never got up and spoke before, and I said, well, look, Matt, this is my only recommendation, the content you have in there is some of the most beautiful things, I mean, that's just the word of the Lord, brother, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen, and I said, my only recommendation is just don't get up there and read it off the page. Oh, no, no, no. I said, this all, read it, get it in your heart, and just let it, let it flow out. Amen. Amen. And uh, praise God, he's preached for us on more than one occasion. And every time this brother has preached, he has brought the word of the Lord. So without further ado, I want you to give a good crossway ministry welcome to Brother Matt Darden. Brother, preach the gospel. Amen. Brother Mac, so much. This friendship means so much to me. My friendship with Aaron. Uh, recently, I was reflect, reflecting back on some of the things that God has done in my life, and um, I thought about how God destroyed the high bites, the high tights, the Gergeshites, the parasites. Yeah, yeah. God destroyed all the yeah. ites till they were out of sight. Yes. Yes. But He left some ites here, yeah. and I've dealt with these ites on more than one occasion in the last two years. Mm. I've had two run-ins with the termites. At my house. Anybody have some termites going on in your life? And I thought about John as he's exiled on the Isle of Patmos and he wrote, he, he, he begins to write the book of Revelation. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, thank hallelujah. you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 <laughs> John saw a door that was open in heaven and there was a, he saw there was one that spoke to him that sounded like a trumpet. 
And he saw one that sat upon the throne that was to look upon. There was a rainbow round about the throne. It was to look upon like an emerald. He saw the Father in heaven. And there was voices, there was thunderings, and there was lightnings. And I thought, that's not a place that termites are going to be snacking. <laughs> Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you, but I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, you may be also. And I started dealing with some water leaks at my house. I had termites. I had water problems. But I'm thankful in my mansion there's not going to be termites. There ain't going to be no water problems. The only water in Revelation is the water that's flowing out of the throne yeah. room of yeah. God. Yeah. It's proceeding forth out of the throne. John said, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. And a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. And God is going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. There's going to be no more death, no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. And the one that sat up on the throne said, Behold. I said, the one that sat up on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And everything is going to be made new soon. We're not going to have no more death, no more crying. And one day the trumpet of God is going to sound. Yes. The dead in Christ are going to rise first and we which are alive and remain. Oh, we'll be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. Yes. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No more sin, no more the, no more the presence of no more sin nature. Because when we see him, yes. we're going to be as he yes. is. We're yes. going to have a glorified yes. body just like him. Amen. But while we're here, we're going to have to deal with water leaks. We're going to have to deal with termites, but there's coming a day that we ain't going to be dealing Hallelujah. with those things anymore. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 41, verse 50. Thank you, Jesus. Genesis Hallelujah. chapter 41 and verse 50. Once again, I just thank Matt for the opportunity. I ministered here back in the day, like he said, uh, maybe six times on Wednesday nights. And the Lord opened an opportunity at our church. I started ministering to the youth. and. Uh, I ministered one Sunday before, back in October of 2019. It went really well. And this is only my second Sunday to ever better preach. So, Hallelujah. you know, the Bible says that your gift will make room for you. Amen. So, if you're a preacher or you're a teacher, let God open those doors. Because when God opens a door, ain't no man can Amen. shut it. Amen. You let Amen. God open the doors for you. And I'm Hallelujah. thankful that this door was open. Thank you, Jesus. Genesis chapter 41, verse 50. Hallelujah. Genesis 41, 50. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which is Seneth, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Verse 52. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Mm. For God has called me to be fruitful. In the land of my affliction. Joseph is one of the greatest types of Christ in the Old Testament. At just 17 years old, he would be hated by his brothers. He would be thrown into a pit. He would be sold into slavery. He would end up in a prison. And then overnight, he would be elevated to the second most powerful man in the world. Trials don't come into our life to destroy, but to develop us. To strengthen our faith. And develop Christ-like character in our heart and life. And when Joseph says that God caused him to be fruitful, he's talking about his children. It seems that he reflected back on all that God had done in his life as he named his children. And I believe that those names are indicative. They're an indication of his spiritual condition. God wants to produce fruit in the lives of his people. Amen. Not just in the good times. Yes. Not just on the mountaintops. A lot of times it's much easier to believe God when everything is going good in our life. But what about in the valleys? What about in the trials? What about in the storms? God wants to produce fruit in our lives in the good times and in the bad times. But you know, many times we're more concerned with exiting a trial rather than enduring the trial. The Bible talks about we've got to remain under. That we must remain under the trial in a God-honoring way to learn the lesson that it has come to teach us. But you've been there along with me. We're two days, three days, a week or a month into a trial. And all we can say is, God, would you please just end my affliction, God? Do you even see me down here? Do you even love me? Do you even care about me anymore? God, 
would you just end my affliction whenever we, I believe we should be saying, God, would you make me fruitful in the land of my affliction, yeah. in the midst yeah. of my trouble, in the midst of my misery, in the midst of the things I go through. God, let that be our prayer this morning. God, would you make me fruitful? Yeah. in the land of my affliction that's the title of the message fruitful in the land of affliction you. would you pray with me father in jesus name yeah. i just thank you lord for a morning to come together and worship you praise you to preach your word lord i'm asking that the preacher would come lord that the teacher would come the one that makes teaching and preaching easy lord the, that the holy spirit spirit would anoint me lord that my preaching would not be with enticing words on man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your children's faith would not stand on the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Lord, I pray that you would open up everyone's heart, soul, mind, and body to hear and to receive this message, God. I thank you, Lord, that it would produce fruit in the lives of your people. Lord, yes. some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. Yes. Lord, you don't ask us to produce fruit, but you do ask us to bear fruit. We thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You know, I thought about Satan and about how he is the, he's the master deceiver. But you know he's also the master divider and that's what he does he comes along and not only does he want to divide the church but he wants to cause division in this world and i don't watch the news much because i don't believe most of the stuff that they tell us i believe that's a platform that satan uses but he uses it to cause division between people he wants to put blacks against whites whites against blacks police against everyone everyone against police but friend, I wish the people on this planet would understand we all come from the culture of the world. We all come from the culture of Adam. We're all born in sin, separated from God. The Bible says God is no respecter of, per uh, of persons, that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's right. But I'm thankful that we don't have to be dead in sins and trespasses anymore. That God did not leave us helpless. He did not leave us hopeless. The Bible says Jesus is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means, I just like to say it like this, before there was a Peter or a James or a John. Before there was an Apostle Paul. Before there was a King David or a King Solomon. Before there was an Abraham and Ur of the Chaldees. Before there was a man or woman on this earth, before there was a heaven or an earth, the triune God here had a plan yes. that he would create a man. That man would drop the, fall and, drop the ball and fall into sin. But that Jesus would come. God had a plan yes. that the last Adam would come to make right what the first Adam made wrong. Amen. And now at salvation, whenever we recognize that we're a sinner and we're in need of a savior, and we reach out, we repented of our sins, and we accepted Jesus Christ by faith. God places a justification verdict over our life. What does that mean? That means God looks at you and he says, not guilty. Amen. That never gets old. I talk about justification all the time. He says, not guilty. Yes. And it goes further than that. Innocent of all charges. And righteousness is placed, this imputed into our account, not because of anything that we did, but because of what we believed. God looks us at us just as if we have never, we are perfect. Not because we're perfect, not because of what we do, but because of what he did. Yeah. Because we're in the perfect one. At salvation, we were placed, we were immersed into the person of Christ. But listen, now that we're justified, we don't just pack our bags and wait to go to heaven. That's right. God desires to produce fruit yes. in our lives. I'm talking love, joy. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And for the fruit of the Spirit to be produced in the life of the believer, we must be connected to the true vine. Yes. John 15 and 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Yes. And friend, if Jesus is the true vine, that must mean that we could get a hold of a false vine. Come on. There's a false vine running rampant Come in on, the land man. today. There's a false vine running rampant in the church today. That false vine, I believe, represents religion. That false vine, I believe, represents false doctrine. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 38 through 42, Elisha told his servant to go out and make a pottage. Yeah. He wanted him to make a pottage for the sons of the prophet. And the Bible says a man went out 
and he got a hold of a wild vine. Oh there was a dearth, there was a famine in the land. In the midst of a famine in your life, any old wild vine can look good. Come on. And the Bible says you got a lap full of those gourds. It's a type of fruit. And the man shred that into the pottage. And as the men began to eat, they said, man of God, there's death in the pot. Yes. See, that's what false doctrine does. There's going to be death in the pot. Come on, false doctrine, doctrine will wrap itself around your belief system. I'm talking just a little bit. It will wrap itself around your belief system and you will begin to experience death yes. in your life. Man of God, there's death in the pot. And what did Elisha do? He poured some meal into Come the on. pot. He poured some flour into the pot. That's a type of the word of God. Yes, Lord. That's what made it edible to them. That's what made it possible for them to be able to eat. If we would just get into this book, get off a two-faced book, get, off of, get out of all the other books and Come get on, back God. to this book. We wouldn't get hung up in false doctrine. I love reading other books that help me to learn the word of God. But a while back, uh, the Holy Spirit was convicting me. And I thought, you know what? I don't know everything about this book. Yeah. So I need to not spend so much time in so many other books. That's what opens you up to false doctrine. Some man has done twisted and perverted the scriptures. And you get off into reading that on, instead of getting back to this Preach book. It. There is no false doctrine in this book. Yeah, yeah. The message of this Bible is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. The Bible started off with a promise in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of the serpent. And at the end of Revelation, this Bible calls him the Lamb. Yes. The Lamb. He's the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. The message through this whole book is all about the cross. It's all about Christ. And if you were getting that message, we wouldn't get so hung up in false doctrine. We wouldn't get so hung up in religion. And it'd be all about what we do. And that false, like I said, that false vine, it can also represent religion. I like to refer to religion as fig leaves. <laughs> it's fig leaves before God. That's what Adam and Eve did. They sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin. But without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there is no remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And friend, when you pull a leaf off a tree, you know what it does? It, tur it turns brown, it shrivels up, and it dies. You know what that means? You got to keep on pulling leaves. You got to keep on sewing them together. You got to keep on putting them. The work never ends. Yes. Yeah, right. Jesus once sacrificed. Then he sat down at the right hand of yes. God. That's the sacrifice that we need. So if you find yourself trusting in self, that's what religion is. It's trusting in ourself, our own education, our own ability, our own talents. If you find yourself clothed in fig leaves, you're not going to see the fruit of the Spirit being produced in your life. I said this before years ago. Have you ever seen a fig leaf with a fig hanging off the end? No? You ever seen a piece of fruit hanging off of a leaf? No, you know why? Because fruit don't grow from leaves. I said fruit doesn't grow from leaves. If you trust in self and you clothe yourself in fig leaves, you are not going to see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. I said we've got to be connected to the true vine, and that's salvation. We are connected to the true vine. But every branch that doesn't bear fruit, God takes it away. Amen. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, he purges it, that it may bring forth more. That's the part we don't like. Yes. It's the purging process, the pruning process. See, that circumcision made without hands, that's God. Yes. Pastor Matt can't circumcise you. I can't circumcise you. Right. That circumcised is done by the Holy Spirit. He yes. rushed in with the scalpel of God. That's salvation. Cut the sin nature away from you, and he reconstructed you. Amen. And he made a new man. He resurrected a new man in Christ yes. Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And that word to prune, to purge, it speaks of the cleanse from impurity and filth. That's what the Holy Spirit does. There's, there's things in our life that don't line up with the will of God, the way of God, or the word of God. And if we would anchor our faith in Christ and Him crucified, the Holy Spirit will begin removing these impurities. He will be, begin pruning us. That's the part that we don't like, and it doesn't always feel good, but it's necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Once Lord. again, we're not asked to produce fruit, but we are asked to bear fruit, yeah. that we're supposed to carry fruit. That's the power, that's the power of the te uh, uh, that's your testimony. That's the power and the grace of God. Yes. A filthy sinner like me could be saved and fruit be produced in my life. So we're connected to the true vine, that's salvation. But the Bible also, Jesus said that we've got to learn to abide. Abide in me and I in you. That's the part that the church has missed. That's the part that we haven't understood. That's the part that the message of the cross teaches us. Not only how to be saved, how do I live saved? Yes. The Bible says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. 
Yes. I received him by faith in Christ and what he did. And that's the same way I walk in him. That's how I abide in him. That's how I rest in him. That's how I remain in him. We've got to learn to abide in Christ. And my wife, Michelle, said something a while back and it was profound. So I want to give her credit for it. But I know that the Holy Spirit gave it to her. She said, just because you're flourishing doesn't mean you're fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. Let the Holy Spirit deal with a couple people real quick. Just because you're flourishing doesn't mean you're fruitful. Amen. See, you can be flourishing in the eyes of the world and be unfruitful in the eyes of God. I said you can be flourishing in the eyes. You can have a big old nice house. You can have a bunch of nice vehicles and have all of these things in your life. And you can be unfruitful in the eyes of God. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust corrupts, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust does not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There's one thing that we should be concerned about in this life, and that's winning souls. Everything that we do in this life, if it's not geared towards winning souls, to be honest with you, it's really, it's for nothing. It's really a waste of time if you think about it. There's only one thing you can bring with you to heaven. I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. <laughs> Any of y'all ever seen a U-Haul behind a The things that we acquire in this life, it's all going to pass away and fall away. The only thing that you can bring up to heaven with you is the souls that you have won along the way. I said, just because you're flourishing, it doesn't mean you're fruitful. Amen. And really, what I'm talking about going into Genesis 37 and, and just beginning to talk about the life of Joseph, it starts off, Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger. That word stranger speaks of a sojourner. It speaks of a pilgrim. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they were sojourners. They were pilgrims. They lived in tents. This place was not their home. Yeah. If you plant your feet too deep in the soil of this earth, one day the trumpet of God's going to sound and you're going to be stuck here. Mm -hmm. The dead yeah. in Christ are going to rise first and you're going to miss it. Yes, I heard sir. it said that way before. If you plant your feet, I said, too deep in the soil of this earth, that we will not make it out of here. Mm. You'll still have a chance. <laughs> It's going to be rough, but you, you still have a chance, even if you miss that rapture. But the Bible says Israel, and really it's talking about Jacob. Uh, God changed Jacob's name to Israel, but I'm, I'm just calling Jacob to keep it easy. Jacob loved Joseph more than all of his children. He loved Joseph more than the rest of the children. There was 12 children. Joseph was the second to youngest, and the Bible says that Jacob made a coat of many colors for Joseph. It represented the birthright. Even though Reuben was the first born, born Joseph, the second to youngest, he would have the birthright. And this caused his brothers to hate him. They hated him. And then on top of that, Joseph begins having dreams from the Lord. The man is just 17 years old. And the Lord begins giving him dream, dreams. And he saw, he saw themselves, they were binding sheaves, him and his brothers. It speaks of a, a bundle of grain, of, of grain stalks. And the Bible says that his sheep had stood up and the other sheep, his brother's sheep, bowed down to his sheep. So they, his brother said, you're telling me you're going to have dominion over us and you're going to reign over us and our father already loves you more than all of us? And then the Lord gives him another dream. This time 11 stars, the sun and the moon bow down to him. And he goes and tells his father Jacob and Jacob even rebukes him. Right. But then the Bible says that he observed the same. He knew there was something more to these dreams, that it wasn't just any ordinary dreams. Right, I said right. this caused Joseph's brothers to hate him. Mm -hmm. But you got to understand, Jacob loved his son. And the Bible says he was going to send them to the brothers in Shechem. The father loved his son. And he sent him to his brethren, the Jews, so to speak. And guess what? They hated him. They hated him, just like Joseph experienced the hatred from his brothers. The people that were here on earth when Jesus came, I said they hated Jesus. They didn't want to have anything to do with this Redeemer. They didn't want to have anything to do with this Messiah. And you know, Joseph's just so eager and ready to go to his brothers, his brothers that hate him. You know what he said? Here am I. For I thought about the triune God here when they had that meeting and it was decided that Jesus would come. Jesus yeah. stood up and said, prepare me a body. I'll go. My Lord. Send me. I'll Hallelujah. go. That's what Joseph said. Hallelujah. Here I am, Father. Yeah. Send me. Yeah. I'll go to my brothers. The Bible says he went. It doesn't say he went, but in studying, he went about 62 miles. He went 62 miles 
We don't want to ride the church in the rain. <laughs> the man walked 62 miles road a horse. I don't know the Bible doesn't tell us, but it was a long ways. They didn't have a vehicle. The man went 62 miles to his brethren because that's what his father told wow, him good. to do. And as he's walking up, the brothers are already conspiring to kill him. They're already conspiring to slay him. Let's just slay him, shed his blood, and throw him into a pit. And Reuben says no. See, Reuben stood, he, he, he had the most to gain, I feel like. Because I, I would think the birthright would have went to him if they killed Joseph. He was the only one that actually stopped this situation. Wow. He wasn't as hard, evidently, as his brothers were. But the, the Bible says that they stripped him of his coat and they threw him into a pit. And the Bible says that pit was empty. That there was no water down there. There was no food down there. And it was Judah that decided, hey, it's no profit if we kill him. How about we sell him? You know, if you look up Judah in the Greek, it's Judas. That's a little Bible fact that I had never seen before. When you look up Judah in the Greek, it's Judas. Who was it that had conspired and made a right. deal with the chief priest? Right. It was Judas Iscariot <laughs> that he would sell Jesus to the chief priest for 30 pieces of silver. It was Judah that decided in this situation, let's go ahead and sell him. So Joseph's down there in that pit and he's beginning to experience tribulation in his life. Paul told us what to do with tribulation. He said, not only so, but we glory. We rejoice. We joy in tribulations. That's Romans chapter 5. He says, there, Paul says, therefore being justified by faith, we talked about that, we have peace with God. Yes. That there was an enmity and a hostility between unredeemed man and God. Right, but right. Jesus made peace yes, through the right. blood of his cross all by right. him to reconcile all, all things right. unto himself, yes. whether they be things in heaven or things on earth. Jesus made peace between man and God. And that hostility, that enmity was taken out of the way. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access. They didn't have access to the presence of God in the Old Testament, either, even in the times of Jesus. The presence of God dwelt behind, and the Holy of Holies behind a massive curtain. I'm talking a massive piece of fabric, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, 4 inches thick. The historian Josephus said that four yoke of oxen couldn't even pull that thing apart. But the Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, yes, he sir. said, it is finished. Yes, he sir. gave up the ghost. Yes. And the Bible says that the rock split open, mm. and there was a great earthquake. And that veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, it separated man from the presence of God. That thing was ripped from the top to the bottom. I didn't say from the bottom to the top. The Jews would have said, oh, some man that ripped this thing open, this big four inch thick piece of curtain. No, God ripped it from the top to the bottom yeah. because the way of access was made. You have access this morning yeah. into the throne room of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You can walk right in at any time of any day, on a good day, on a bad day, on your best day, on your worst day. You can walk straight into the throne room of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You can tell him exactly what you think you need. He already knows what you need, but you and I have access by faith into this grace. That talks about grace all the time. What is that? Is God doing in me and for me what I could never do for myself? That's good. That's good. Amen. It's a divine influence on the heart. That means God's doing the work. Yes. It's God doing the work. God, divine influence on the heart, and it's reflection in my life. See, the inside got to be cleaned up before the outside Amen. can become Hallelujah. pure. Hallelujah. Jesus said, Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you Hallelujah. hypocrites. For you clean up the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean up the inside of the cup and of the dish, that the outside may become pure. Hallelujah. See, if you if you run water into a bowl full of chili, you know what's going to happen? It's going to flow out to the outside. But if you would clean that bowl first and then you fill it back up with water, the outside ain't going to get dirty. The inside of man has to be cleaned up yes, first sir. before the outside can become pure. Yes, sir. So we have peace with God. We have access by faith to the grace of God. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And he says, not only so, but we glory. We rejoice. We boast. We glory in tribulation, which truly speaks of oppressing. That pressure is being added to you and our, to our lives whenever we walk through things. There's a pressure. And what's in us begins to come out. Not to show God what's in us. He knows what's in us. It's to show us what's in us. Tribulation is oppressing. It's pressure being added and applied to your life. Tribulation worketh patience. It speaks of endurance. 
It speaks of perseverance. And that's where we get the idea of remaining under in a God-honoring way to learn the lesson that that trial you're going through has come to teach you. Amen. Tribulation work is patience. Patience, experience. Experience speaks of an approved and tried character. That God is applying pressure in my life, which enemies beginning to come out of me. And as I endure and persevere through that trial, right, right. I am gaining the character That's of good. Christ That's in my good. life. Yes. That the Holy Spirit is molding us and conforming us unto the image of Christ. Amen. That's what God wants to do in our life. Amen. So put yourself in Joseph's position at 17 years old. I know where I was. I was in high school. I was playing football. I thought I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Most of the guys would probably know what I'm talking about whenever you was younger. And I just feel like if I was Joseph, I probably wouldn't have beat all 11 of them, but I would have taken a couple of them down. I would have pulled a couple of them into that pit and at least jumped on them. I would have been fighting my way out of there. You're not throwing me in. But see, Joseph was fruitful in the pit. He didn't defend himself. He didn't murmur. He didn't complain. <laughs> did Jesus murmur? Did Jesus complain while he was here, even though his brethren... Hated him. Yeah. Joseph, that's if you want to write down a point, Joseph was fruitful in the pit. And the Bible says that he sold into slavery and he ends up in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar is a captain of the guard. And Potiphar puts everything under Joseph's hand. Everything, his whole house, everything. The only thing he kept back from him was his wife, obviously. Everything was in his hand. Even even Potiphar, an unsaved man, recognized the anointing and that the hand of the Lord was upon this man. The brothers, Joseph's own brothers hated him, but this unsaved man said, I'm going to go ahead and put you over everything in my house, but my house is going to be blessed because of you. <laughs> An unsaved man recognized that and was willing to use that, but his own brothers that were supposed to be the saved folk wanted to kill him and get rid of him. Come on. And the Bible says that there came a day that Potiphar's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. Day after day, the Bible says that she would tell him this. And the Bible says that he did not hearken unto her. He did not listen. He did not obey. And there came a day that she actually grabbed him by his coat. And he left that coat. The Bible says flee from youthful lust. I think it's 2 Timothy 2.22 that we ought to flee from youthful Amen. lust. That's what Joseph did. He ran out of there. I'm not having no part against it. You know what he said? He said, uh, where's it at? He said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Well, I wish we would say that sometimes when Satan sets traps in our life. You know what? I'm not doing this. I'm running out of here. I'm getting away from this. Most men at 17, 18, I don't know exactly how old he is at this point, but he's a young man. Most men probably would have fell into that temptation. But the Bible says he ran out of there, and I thought about Jesus. Joseph being a type of Christ. Hebrews 4.15. Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. It speaks of a sin offering. Jesus did not take sin into himself on the cross of Calvary and have to go to hell and be born again. That's foolishness and that's not in the Bible. If you believe that, you're listening to someone that's not following this book. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became a sin offering that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. And the Bible says Potiphar, of course, got upset because now Joseph's falsely accused. Potiphar's wife goes and tells Potiphar, look, you done brought a Hebrew in here to mock us. He tried to lay with me. Look, I still got his coat. And the Bible says that they threw Joseph into prison. But guess what? The hand of the Lord was upon Joseph. And, and the Lord caused everything that he did to prosper. Yeah. There's eight different times in Genesis 39 that it talks about the Lord. The Lord, the Lord caused everything to prosper. The Lord was with him. The hand of the Lord was upon him. You know what the number eight is in the Bible? It's the number for resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That meant no matter how far into the pit Joseph had to go, there was a resurrection coming. Yes. Yes. No matter how far into the prison he had to go, there was a resurrection coming. There was going to be life that was going to be brought into his situation. Yes. And you and I... I don't know what you're going through this morning, but guess what? God can turn it around. He can bring resurrection life into our situation and turn it around at the last moment. Yes. At the last moment. You may have got a bad report from the doctor, but God can resurrect that problem. God can resurrect that situation. You got a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, daughter that's away from God right now. God can bring resurrection life into that situation and turn them around. Yes. But we just got to believe it. Yes. Will we trust him? Will we be faithful? That's what we see from Joseph. 
Everywhere he went, he was faithful and he was fruitful. I feel it out. I said he was faithful yes. and he was yes. fruitful. Yes. It didn't matter where he had to go. It mattered who was with him. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter where we go. It matters who we are in. Yes. Because we're in him. We're in Christ and we're learning how to abide. I said the number eight is resurrection. Hallelujah. And you know, Joseph, once again, he never defended himself. He didn't defend himself to Potiphar. He didn't defend himself to his brothers at the pit. He never defended himself, didn't murmur, didn't complain. He was just going to go wherever God called him to go. Right. It didn't matter how far down he would be or how far up he would be. Down in the pit, yes. up at the palace at Potiphar's house. Down into the yes. prison, up yes. at the palace. It didn't matter where he was going to go. But he Hallelujah. never defended himself. Right. You and I, we always feel like we've got to defend ourselves. Right. Right. People right. hate us. That's right. Oh, brother, I'm... I'm deleting that number. They done messed up. I ain't talking to them again. And then when you, un, uh, you, you, uh, you, you unfriend them on Facebook, now it's really getting real. <laughs> They're going to text me. I ain't talking to them. If I see them on the side of the road, I ain't stopping. If they got a flat tire, oh well. If they run out of gas, I ain't going to help them. You all know that's how we feel. That's what rises up in us many times. But this man never even defended himself. Everywhere that he went. Joseph, if you want to write this, Joseph was fruitful in the prison. Mm -hmm. See, Joseph was fruitful in the pit. Now he's fruitful in the prison. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that there came a day that the butler and the baker, the chief butler and the chief baker had offended Pharaoh. And Pharaoh cast them down into the prison also. And Joseph was over everyone in the prison. This man had the favor of the Lord upon his life. And he seen the, the butler and the baker that they were sad. See, he was compassionate towards people. We ought to be compassionate yes. towards people, yes. towards the church folk yes. and towards the unsaved folk. Lord, help me be more compassionate and sympathetic towards my wife. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I feel like I'm not compassionate enough mm -hmm. towards people. Mm -hmm. Help us to be compassionate. He saw that chief butler and that chief baker that they were sad. Their face was sad. He said, what's wrong? And they said, we both had a dream, but there's no one to interpret the dream. There's no one to interpret our dream. The chief butler had dreamed that there was a vine before him. And there was three branches that came up out of that vine. And that there was clusters of grapes. And uh, the butler saw himself pressing those grapes into a cup. And he was serving it to Pharaoh. And Joseph said, the interpretation is that you're going to be restored back to your former position. That you're going to serve Pharaoh again. But when you do, whenever he restores you, remember me. Think back on me. I was, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. I didn't do anything to deserve this dungeon, but would you please remember me and speak peaceably of me unto Pharaoh? And then what the Bible says is whenever the baker saw that the, the interpretation was good, he said, well, I had a dream too. He said that he had three white baskets on his head and the top basket there was baked meats. It speaks of baked goods. And there was birds that came and they were eating those baked goods out that basket on the top of his head. And Joseph said that those three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh's going to lift your head off of you, hang your body out, and that birds are going to come and eat your flesh. Mm -hmm. Why do I bring up these dreams? Because no matter what the interpretation was, whether it announced grace or whether it announced wrath, Joseph was going to tell him exactly what the Lord right. had said. Right. See, we got a lot of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers that twist the message. Right. Right. Joseph did not twist the interpretation. Right. Jesus right. talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. Mm -hmm. He was warning the people where they would end up if they would not eat his flesh and drink his blood. Mm -hmm. Give me a pastor that would still preach about sin. Yeah. Give me a pastor that would still preach about the blood. Yeah. I love yeah. Pastor yeah. Matt because that's what he does. He preaches yeah. the message of the cross, uh -huh. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes. Once yes. again, there's a story in this yes. book. Yes. Hallelujah. Tell me about sin. Tell me about the second. Friend, Pastors, if somebody's watching on there, if you don't preach a bloody gospel, then you ain't preaching the gospel. Because this gospel is a bloody gospel. The gospel in this book is a bloody gospel. Every ounce of blood shed in the Old Testament pointed to one that would come. His name is Jesus. He shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. He made a way for you and I. And we have access now. Yes. 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 Give me someone that will not twist the message and pervert the message and preach something that really ain't got nothing to do with this book. Come on. Yes. Preach it, brother. But you know what the Bible says? The butler forgot him. Mm -hmm. He was restored to his former position, and the butler forgot. You know what that was? That was a broken promise. Mm -hmm. 
I know some people in here, someone has made promises to you. Yes, yes. And those promises were broken. Mm. And many times that hatred rises up in our heart once again. And yeah. we don't want to talk to that person. We don't want to see that person. Has anyone ever had a broken promise yeah. that they dealt with in their life? Us, you know what? Joseph was fruitful. Write that down. Joseph was fruitful through a broken promise. Mm -hmm. See, my God is not a God of the broken promise. My God is the God of the unbroken promise. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It will bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his. That was a promise in Genesis 3.15. God preached the truth of the gospel to Adam, to Eve, to Satan, and to the serpent. That a redeemer was going to come. I got to eliminate you out of this garden, but look for one that will come. Amen. And he clothed them with the coats of skins. That, that was the first sacrifice in the Bible. That was the first shedding of blood. I told you, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. God made a promise in Genesis 3.15. And he brought that promise line upon line, the Bible says, in the line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. The seed of the woman is going to come and he's going to crush the head of the serpent. And that's what Jesus did. He yes. came and took back the authority that Adam and Eve had gave to yes. Satan. I said, our God is the God of the unbroken promise. Yeah. But if someone has broken a promise in your life, you got to let it go. You got to forgive. Joseph was fruitful through a broken promise. And the Bible says two more years passed by. When we're reading through these chapters, it, it may feel like days or weeks. We're talking years that go by between these circumstances and situations. Two more years pass by and Joseph, I mean, I'm sorry, Pharaoh has a dream. And there's no one that can interpret the dream. They bring in the magis magicians and all the people in Egypt that could normally interpret the dream. None of them could interpret the dream. And that's when the, the butler remembered Joseph. There was a man of God in that prison and he interpreted my dream. Let's go and get him. And the Bible says that Joseph shaved himself and he got himself presentable. He changed his clothes and he went before Pharaoh. He waited two more years after that broken promise. And he would interpret that dream for Pharaoh. There's going to be, guys, there's so much stuff here, but just to stay on point with the message, there would be seven years of plenty, there would be seven years of famine. And you need to store up during those seven years of plenty that we can make it through the seven years of famine. And overnight, Joseph exchanged a prison for the palace. Yes. He was elevated to the second yeah. most powerful man in the world, only behind Pharaoh. Thank you, Jesus. I said overnight. I said God can resurrect your problem. Mm -hmm. He can change it around at the yes. very last yes. moment. Yes. We just have to trust him. Yes, Lord. And really Joseph's final test, it was when his brothers would go to Egypt to buy food. Would he feed the hand and the, and the mouths of those that betrayed him mm. and those that hated him? That's good. What did mm. Jesus do? <laughs> Come on. Would Judas eat too? Judas fed the mouth and the hand of the one that would betray him. Even before he got betrayed, Jesus knew it was Judas Iscariot, that's good. but Judas ate too. That's and that's what Joseph did. He fed his brothers. The Bible says that multiple times he would weep as he would see his brothers. That doesn't look like hatred in his heart. It doesn't look like there's unforgiveness in his heart. He would weep over his brothers. And I thought about Jesus as he would weep and lament over Jerusalem when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. God always had a man of God in the Old Testament preaching the right way, talking about a coming redeemer and a coming Messiah, but the people didn't want to hear it. They would kill those prophets and they would stone those people. But just like Jesus wept over Jerusalem, Joseph wept over his brothers. Yes. I said, yes. Judas yes. ate too. Yes. Would you feed the hand and the mouth of the one that betrayed you? Of the one that yes. broke a promise to you? Good preaching, bro. Would you feed them? Would you invite them over? My Lord, Thank you, Jesus. we won't even text them. Thank we you, won't Jesus. even tell them hello when we see them. Yeah. Would you invite them over and prepare a meal and feed them in your house? That's what Joseph did. That's what Jesus did. And Jesus being a great example, I would like to live my life after him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. See, Joseph could have let unforgiveness fester in his heart, right. but he chose to forgive uh -huh. his brothers. And he told them, don't be angry. God sent me before you. God meant it for good. He sent me ahead of you to preserve life. Hallelujah. There was no hatred in Joseph's heart towards his brothers. He realized, you know what? It was God that sent me here. The Bible says all things work together for good. 
for those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. Yes. I know it doesn't look good and it doesn't feel good, but it's all working for good. It was yes. God that sent Joseph ahead of his brethren. But Joseph would have to be tested in the pit. He had to be tested in the prison before he could be ruler in the power. See, he had to, he had to serve right in the lower places. Would he still serve God in the pit? Would he serve in Potiphar's house? Would he serve the keeper of the prison in the prison? Then he could be elevated to the second most powerful man in the world. But he had to be tested up until that point. Can you handle this? Or will the weight of this crush you? He had to walk through these testings. God meant it for good and sent me ahead of you to preserve life. And this, this forgiveness that we see coming from the life of Joseph. I thought about Jesus whenever he was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Can you and I do that? We won't even forgive people half the time, but those that crucify Jesus, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Thank you, Jesus. And just getting back to our main text, it says there was two sons that God gave him. Manasseh means forgetful. Because Joseph forgot the injustices that were done to him, he had another son named Ephraim, and it means fruitful. Yes. Because Joseph forgot the injustices that were done to him, God caused him to be fruitful in the land of his affliction. Thank you, Jesus. God caused him to be fruitful. It was God that causes us to be fruitful. We're in Christ. We're connected to the true vine. And no matter what we're going through, God wants to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our life. I know that his fruit is talking about his children, but whether it's physical fruit or spiritual fruit, I believe God wants to produce fruit in our lives. Yes. Even in the rough times, even in the hard times. If you're harboring uh, singers and musicians, I don't know if y'all know them to come back and play a song or yes. if y'all want to come back. I'm about to close here. If you're harboring a root of bitterness, let it go and let God make you fruitful. Jesus, man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can let something like that, that unforgiveness, fester in our heart and it will begin to rot. Thank you, Lord. And I don't believe you're going to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life if you got unforgiveness in your heart. We yes. got to forgive men their trespasses for our Father in heaven Thank to you. forgive us. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be in that category. That I'm not forgiving people. And now I can't be forgiven. Yeah. You've got to forgive before you forget. If you have not forgotten. Yeah. It's because you have not forgiven. I know there's bad things that happen to us at times. Things that we may not ever really forget. But when we think about that situation. When we think about that thing that we went through. It should not cause hatred to rise up in our heart. God wants to bring healing to those areas in our life. That we would not let hatred and unforgiveness fester. I said you have to yes. forgive before you forget. Yes. If you have not forgiven, it's because, or you have not forgotten, it's because you have not forgiven. Praise God. I don't know if there's someone on live stream or someone here that doesn't know Jesus. I want to ask you to raise your hand or even come up here. If you would realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Yes. And you would reach out by faith to the redemption plan of God, Jesus Christ and him crucified, that you can be saved right now. And really the altar call this morning is, is twofold. If there's bitterness in your heart, if there's unforgiveness in your heart towards someone, I don't care who it's towards. It doesn't matter. If there's unforgiveness or bitterness in your heart, I want you to come up to these altars and just lay it down. Nobody's going to judge you. I'm not going to judge you. I care about what God thinks, not about what man yes. thinks. It matters what God thinks. And for the rest of us, if you feel like you've been going through a trial and you say, you know what, Lord, I really haven't been too fruitful. I really haven't been seeing love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's all things. That's the fruit of the Spirit. If you don't just work on two or three, we should be seeing all nine of these. Yeah. And that's the work that the Lord is doing in us, conforming us to the image of Christ. We're supposed to be, be, be bringing forth fruit in our life, even in the midst of our affliction. So if you've been going through a troubling time or a trial and you say, you know what, Lord? I really haven't been too fruitful in the midst of this situation. I want you to come up here. I want you to lay it down at the altar. Yeah. And I want you to let God do a work in your heart. 